Perhaps good morning if you're out on the West Coast. My name is Zach Canizzo with NOAA's Marine Protected Areas Center, and thank you for tuning into today's Marine Protected Areas Center webinar, which is co-hosted by OCTO. Today's webinar is titled Resist, Accept, or Direct, a Decision Framework for Navigating Climate-Driven Ecological Transformation. We are very excited to have three outstanding panelists to discuss, to discuss this topic. Dr. Gregor Skierman, ecologist with the National Park Service's Climate Change Response Team. Dr. Wendy Morrison, a fisheries ecologist with the National Marine Fisheries Service's Office of Sustainable Fisheries, and Dr. Kerry Kappel, a research scientist and senior fellow at UC Santa Barbara's National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. The presenters are here today representing FedNet and bring an impressive depth of experiences to the discussion of navigating ecological change in marine systems. Our first presenter today will be <clears throat> Dr. Gregor Skierman. He's an ecologist with the National Park Service's Climate Change Resource Program, where he works with national parks and partners to understand and adapt to a wide range of climate change impacts. His work focuses on incorporating climate projections into management and planning, analyzing climate adaptation options in the context of policy, tracking ongoing adaptation in the national parks, and developing and synthesizing management relevant science. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Skierman to begin our presentation. Thanks very much, Zach. Am I coming through clear? Yep, Sonia, hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump right in, and Zach, thank you for that intro. Um, on this title slide to the left, we have a figure showing us uh, a directional change in mean global temperature from 1850 through the year 2017. And what we see is a progression from darker blues through lighter blues and whites into oranges, and then into increasingly red and even blackish reds. So this is a kind of progression that many of us have, well, all of us have seen over the past few decades of our lives. There's, we're clearly in a new place thermally and progressing directionally. And these kinds of directional changes in the fundamental drivers of ecological condition uh, present managers with the prospect of uh, sort of concomitant changes in the, in the ecological systems that they manage. And this figure on the right as uh, shows uh, for a particular ecological system in Alaska that I'll talk about a little later, potential ways that change could play out. And ultimately, this kind of thinking and realization on the part of managers raises a question. How am I supposed to manage a system that is transforming because of human influence into something I may not recognize? Um, I'm going to give us a quick roadmap as to where this, this 20 minute presentation is taking us. I'm going to briskly uh, review some ecological changes uh, to ground us in, in the problem. I'm going to describe this group FedNet, of which I'm a member, and how it seeks to address those changes. I'm going to recognize that thinking about managing for change is not brand new and that we're building on uh, earlier thought and trying to move forward, uh, in particular with a resist, accept, direct framework that tries to help, a ma help answer that manager question by breaking down the options that a manager has in thinking about how they might be used complementarily and cooperatively. I'm going to then spend a decent amount of time grounding the, the discussion, particularly the discussion that will follow my presentation, with some case studies to illustrate application of this thinking. And then I'm going to back off and just recognize that even though a lot of managers get it and are forward thinking, the guidance and paradigms that they live with are often lagging behind. Um, and so managers are challenged with how to apply this kind of thinking uh, strategically at scales. And then ultimately, I'll, I'll wrap up this part by just reminding us uh, what the group I'm part of is seeking to do as far as guiding managers through these challenges and helping shift uh, larger paradigms. Uh, I could start anywhere, but I thought I'd start in Alaska, a place where we're seeing really intense, uh, fast rates of change uh, that we're probably all aware of to some degree. And against that background of rapid change, the year 2019, the summer, this warm season, has given us a glimpse of the future. Uh, records of rainfall at Denali National Park, for instance, weren't just succeeded, they were shattered. And at the same time, 100 miles down the road, they had the driest summer on record, so a lot of variability. Um, this is a representation also of temperature uh, this past warm season. So in these graphs, the zero is the average from 1981 to 2010. So not a new normal, but the average of a period of dramatic change. And against that average, what we see in the lower graphs and the left-hand graphs um, is some departures on the order of up to nearly 8 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, a real, a real glimpse of the future, and this is why we saw those headlines about 
the Arctic burning up, about uh, drought and massive heat waves in places like Anchorage. And, and that heat caused uh, the disappearance largely of the Bering Sea cold pool off Alaska's west coast. And those changes in the ocean uh, led to thousands of seabirds starving to death. And as a quote here at the top of this uh, popular media article points out, it wasn't just managers and scientists uh, who were aware of this. Every person in the community knew something was wrong, uh, wrong based on their expectations of how the world works. And so this can be illustrated graphically um, over time. And so the lower part of this figure shows us uh, increasing temperatures in a number of different parts of the ocean along the west coast, particularly in the last five years. And then across the top, we've got a timeline with little circles on it, and those circles represent seabird die-off events. And what we can see is those are becoming uh, larger uh, and more frequent, such that in the past few years, they've stacked on top of each other, and people are starting to use words like ecological collapse. Similarly, this summer, in uh, the Brooks River in Katmai National Park and Preserve, um, we saw a historic uh, exceedance of a threshold of suitability of water temperatures in that important river for salmon. Uh, what this graph shows is during the course of the summer with the colored lines that in recent years we've started seeing temperatures pop above that threshold and become a barrier to salmon migration and spawning. But this summer was different. Instead of a couple of week-long episodes, almost uninterrupted from the solstice to the end of August, uh, this river uh, and the temperatures in it really uh, precluded uh, salmon spawning and migration. And these salmon were ready to go. Uh, they were full of eggs and full of sperm, uh, but encountering these kinds of problems and making uh, folks wonder the same thing that the seabird uh, folks are wondering about. Uh, moving a little bit into the terrestrial realm, in general, managers are increasingly confronting uh, the limits of ecological resilience there as well. This is Kenai Peninsula in southern Alaska. Changes in vegetation over a three-decade period can be seen from space. It can also be seen from air, where a boreal forest has been hit by beetles, by drought, ultimately by fire, and replaced by tens and tens of thousands of acres of monotypic grassland. In the southwestern U.S., we see similar phenomena where we see drought um, turning a pinyon juniper woodland into a juniper scrubland, followed by more fire and more transformation. If we look across the globe, we find that hotter droughts in the Anthropocene are causing tree mortality really everywhere in noticeable um, abundances. Of course, the ocean has its own thresholds, its own tipping points, and its own changes uh, that we're becoming increasingly aware of, in part because of an important group I'll talk about called Ocean Tipping Points. And uh, it's important to recognize that these transformations we're seeing have happened historically even before uh, the advent of industrial humans and their climate changing ways. And there's a reminder there that systems can do this when uh, mean conditions in their drivers change directionally. And I'll come back to this figure and dwell a little more on it in a few minutes. Climate change is not the only relevant driver, but it does have a unique place in our discussion because of its pervasiveness and because of its persistence, the fact that we can expect uh, more change uh, for as far as the eye can see into the future. Uh, there's also some uniqueness in the fact that climate change, uh, because it's driving the fundamental drivers of ecological systems, can produce new ecological states that may be acceptable. Uh, an example of this is the northwest expansion of moose over a century and a half in Alaska, which hasn't um, been met with too much dismay at all. Um, climate change is also um, unique in that it's a bit of a puzzle in terms of what we're talking about, and there can be some confusion uh, between a focus on the disturbance events that trigger change and steady change in the mean conditions underneath that that drive the change ultimately. And either one or both uh, can push systems beyond their resilience. A recent paper by Harris et al. I thought really put this together graphically in a way that's useful. Climate is composed of long-term variability like the El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycle, for instance. Uh, this is the answer to, yes, climate has always changed, but generally within familiar bounds. Uh, then we've got short-term weather variability, our extreme events on the scale from uh, days to months to uh, seasons. And then underneath it all, we have the demon climate change, as E.O. Wilson likes to refer to it, an intensifying press disturbance, a directional change in baseline conditions. And Harris et al. put this all together to create uh, 
a curve of experienced weather here in the black, which over time begins to increasingly punch up into, with its extremes, survivable and then extinction extremes of a hypothetical population of organisms whose size responds uh, accordingly, initially uh, manifesting ecological resilience and recovering from impacts, but as those impacts get into survivable and extinction extremes, that population begins to experience directional change headed in this case towards extirpation. An ecological uh, transformation, which our group uh, operationally defines here, uh, can arise from um, a number of population and declines and extirpations like this. Uh, back to our paleo uh, diagram, uh, this is a representation of over uh, 13,000 years of high resolution history at a very local scale in a forest near Seattle in the Puget pa uh, Sound lowlands. And as we move through time from left to right, what we see is changes in the relative abundance of key forest taxa. Uh, toward the left of the graph, there's a YDC, that's the Younger Dryas Chronos Sequence. That's a period of time that saw changes in climate comparable to what we can expect in the coming century. And all of this change uh, has been analyzed through a cluster analysis that's represented at the top of this diagram with several different colored bands. The breaks in between those bands are moments of transformation, and we can see that the younger dryas led to two of them in fairly rapid succession. The ultimate message here, as I said earlier, is even in the absence of modern industrial humans and their, and their influences, we can see that systems with enough change in baseline uh, drivers, uh, when triggered, uh, come back as something different. So briefly, who we are as a group of short history, we're a group of federal natural resource managers and adaptation specialists. We and the managers we work with or, 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 um, or help uh, are seeing ecological transformations on land and waters in, in um, places where our agencies manage. And we include social scientists, we include natural science, uh, we represent a diversity of agencies that I'll show us in a minute. Um, we didn't really have a, a photo um, of, of all of us, just all of us, and so I offer this one taken from a workshop recently. I call it sort of FedNet and Friends. Uh, um, it includes, interestingly, uh, Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse there in the middle who dropped by because he was interested in hearing uh, a little bit more about uh, thinking about dealing with ecological uh, transformation. We as a group have been discussing what directional change and, and transformation means uh, for resource management for a couple of years now, and I'll give just a quick bit of that history. The National Adaptation Forum is an every two-year gathering of adaptation professionals, and in 2017 there was a key symposium led by Bruce Stein of the National Wildlife Federation and, and um, featuring at least two members of our FedNet group that's, that posed the question, what do we do when we can't resist ecological change? What does adaptation look like then? Uh, that was a groundbreaking session. It led to some uh, post-NAF planning, uh, a workshop that kick off, kicked off a working group uh, that brought back uh, new products and thinking to the next meeting of that same uh, conference uh, this past spring. Got a lot of feedback and a lot of enthusiasm, and we're now working on developing a white paper for managers and decision makers developing a number of science products, and moving into sounding boards and workshops in the coming year to keep refining and developing uh, our tools and guidance. Ultimately, we're a group that is grappling with how to manage for change. Uh, the idea is simple, but the who, what, when, where, and how is complex for a number of reasons, some of which I'll get into today. What we're heartened by is the fact that we seem to be part of an emerging uh, community of practice, uh, thinking about transformation. We've got uh, professional society sponsored groups, we've got international groups, we've got regionally uh, focused uh, groups, and we've got ocean tipping points, an important uh, analog for us and an inspiration who are years ahead of us and have done some really important and helpful thinking uh, in breaking a lot of ground that we can sort of drop into. And recently Parks Canada has got wind of uh, what we're up to and we are linking with them and working closer and closer with them every month. Um, this is just a bit of a, a schematic describing FedNet and its membership. I'll just first draw your attention to the logos across the bottom. Uh, our group includes representatives from all the DOI land management agencies as well as NOAA and the USGS. We have two components on the left. Uh, we have a, a focus, a component of our work 
that focuses on uh, managers and on uh, helping explore and translate science, identify best practices, develop uh, frameworks, and, and through all of this, honoring and understanding the differences in missions, goals, and desired outcomes across our agencies and across different uh, stakeholder groups. On the right-hand side, we've got our science function, uh, which seeks to foster uh, ecological and social science focused on ecological transformation to help managers. And so it's really to cultivate, harness, um, and, and help develop coherent science that understands the choices managers are facing um, and is transformation aware. What we realize in all this work, as I mentioned earlier, is thinking about managing for change. That's not new. Um, that, that meeting in 2017 in which uh, we had um, this symposium on when resistance is futile, uh, led by Bruce Stein, sort of riffed off of um, work that came out a few years before, uh, led by the National Wildlife Federation, but including all those familiar logos here as participants. And, and what our, all our organizations said uh, there a half decade ago is, in the face of the kind of change I've described, Managers, conservationists will, will need to learn how to work with change, can't resist all change forever. Uh, sometimes we'll be talking about transformations where the components of systems uh, will change. And that in managing all of this, there might be some cycling between different approaches of managing change and persistence, some sense of complementarity of these approaches. And in all of this, a recognition that because of the kind of change we're talking about, we're not just talking about nibbling at the edges and adjusting strategies, but really reconsidering our fundamental goals and affirming that they still make sense or updating them uh, to uh, take heed of changing conditions. When we think about the spectrum of managing for change, looking back at resisting undesirable change and restoring or returning systems uh, to the way they were to the d degree we can, or alternatively looking forward and thinking about avoiding undesirable future conditions, um, we're thinking about a spectrum, and we're not the first to do so. A lot of folks, uh, many of these agency-based uh, scientists, have done a lot of thinking for over a decade about how to break this up into pieces that are a bit more descriptive and clear and useful for managers. And we drop in there at the bottom uh, alongside another group, that uh, professional society uh, fostered group, um, in having chosen uh, three simple words, resist, accept, or direct, that we think sort of encompass the universe of the options a manager uh, may pursue in the face of uh, or the prospect of change in the system they manage. Let's look um, a little more deeply at this RAD framework. Uh, first thing to bear in mind with all of this, and this will probably come through in discussion, is it's important to be very clear and precise about what is the focus here. Is it a value, like the availability of a, of a species for harvest? Uh, or is it a particular species or system for its own sake? Um, but that, that definition of the focus is always important. And within that, what we're talking about with resist, accept, or direct is how a manager will respond. So it's about manager action in terms of how they will address a trajectory of change, either perspective or ongoing. And so let's, let's break down these terms. So what does resisting change look like? Well, that's about trying to thwart human-directed change away from what we might often call a more natural condition. And so it's about working against that, trying to reverse so as to maintain or restore historically occurring processes, functions, uh, composition. Accepting change is about allowing the system to respond autonomously. Uh, you may do things peripherally, you may interpret, you may explain to people, work with stakeholders, but ultimately the trajectory of the change in this case is not uh, interfered with. And then directing change is about trying to shape uh, that trajectory uh, rather than reverse or just accept it. Uh, different reasons for applying these different approaches. Uh, resisting, I think, is fairly clear. This is traditional conservation with traditional motivations. Accepting is also something we do more than we often acknowledge. Uh, we often cannot feasibly resist change, and we accept it. It may be that some changes are just not impactful uh, based on our values and concerns, or they may even be acceptable um, or desirable by at least some stakeholders or society. And then why would we direct change? Uh, often because resistance is futile and there is an opportunity uh, to get a better outcome than allowing um, autonomous uh, change in a system. Uh, we've done more work in thinking about desired outcomes and goals. 
Um, we've thought about the different values or philosophies that these different approaches are consistent with. Um, and then this is the kind of work we, we go into, is what these approaches entail in detail, and in the, in the bottom row, the specific examples. And there's a lot of text here. I'm not really asking you to do more than maybe just eyeball a few of these to get an idea of the sort of options we're thinking about. What I want to do now is jump into case studies uh, to make this real. Um, and the first cluster I want to focus on is three national wildlife refuges and a neighboring NPS unit dealing in different ways with the same directional change, um, which is sea level rise. And I want to credit uh, my FedNet colleague, John Morton, who currently manages two million acres uh, up in Alaska at the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, but formerly in his career spent a lot of time on the East Coast in uh, refuges like these. And the focus here is on Blackwater and Chincoteague and Chafee National Wildlife Refuges. Um, which are all vulnerable to a foot of uh, sea level rise, uh, let alone uh, some of the higher ends of the projections that we're looking at. Interestingly also, one of them, Blackwater, was recently the focus of a popular media article about ghost forests, about visceral, visual examples of the advance of climate change. And, and as we look around, we're seeing more and more of these sort of popular media articles about seabird die-offs, about uh, forest owls about visible ecological transformation. Um, Chafee National Wildlife Refuge, uh, I'll start there with resistance. Uh, this is a refuge where prospects for inland migration of these natural communities are low. Uh, this place is hemmed in. And so the choice here has been to help as Spartina um, salt marsh persist in place. And that's being done by helping it literally elevate itself by using thin layer uh, iterative depth position of sediment um, protected by thousands of bags of clam and oyster shells and heavy machinery used to accomplish this work. Uh, contrasting example, at Chincoteague and neighboring Assateague Island National Seashore, our NPS unit, after decades of spending a lot of resources resisting uh, change, maintaining artificial dunes, Decisions have been made recently to pull hard infrastructure off of uh, those islands and use softer infrastructure that can be sacrificed or replaced. Um, and on the National Wildlife Refuge side, to allow waterfowl impoundments uh, to transition into different systems. Obviously, there's a lot of savings um, to be made in acceptance, and those are resources that can perhaps be spent more strategically elsewhere. Blackwater um, is interesting because, in contrast, this is a place where uh, not only can um, natural communities migrate uh, inland, but they've been doing so uh, for decades. This park has lost a lot of tidal wetlands to sea level rise, yes, but it's gained almost, uh, I don't know, 60% of that uh, in, in new uh, marsh and upslope migration. And so here the decision has been to uh, direct uh, that change, perhaps accelerate it uh, with a demonstration project. And noteworthy, the final bullet at the bottom uh, points out that even when you're directing change, uh, there's a role for some of these other tools. Uh, you may use resistance approaches to stabilize uh, that new um, condition that you've created. Another example, terrestrial one, again, courtesy of our case study king, John Morton, and also his colleague on the Kenai, Don Magnus, both of whom are FedNet members. Um, this is a large area I mentioned before, uh, this large-scale conversion of a boreal forest to a monotypic grassland. And um, as I said uh, earlier, tens of thousands of acres. And uh, when these managers ask themselves, uh, what's happening to our system, where is it going and why, uh, what they're recognizing is that it's on the move uh, away from the trailing edge of boreal forest climatically and along a borderline between temperate forest and grassland and savanna uh, with the issue that many of the species that characterize those biomes don't exist anywhere near Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And so the managers ask questions about what's going to fill these niches. And they're aware of the fact that humans are bringing uh, many species onto this peninsula into their yards, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, so there's some real questions about the future of this large system. Is this de depauperate grassland resilient, if not necessarily desirable? Are there opportunities to resist this change through uh, creative uh, breeding and outplanting of more resistant versions of historically occurring uh, species? Uh, 
Um, or could this or should this novel system be stewarded towards one that is more diverse or different uh, in some ways, depending on what the values are? Um, and again, this, the choices here are uh, between forest and grassland. Uh, should these managers uh, bring in lodgepole pines or just allow them to hop the fence uh, from neighbors who are doing that? Uh, what does that system look like with a new uh, large ungulate? On the other hand, could this system be managed through prescribed fire to be a grassland, perhaps a more diverse one? Perhaps one with introduced grazers that um, haven't been around for a while, but the fossil record indicates were present uh, in previous millennia. Um, despite managers asking these really um, sharp questions and forward-looking questions, uh, the paradigms and the guidance that they live under uh, lag, of course, and that's no surprise. And so they have a strong resistance flavor, and so does a lot of our own thinking and work, whether we recognize it or not. So at that same forum in 2017, yes, we had a, a one session devoted to the issue of transformation. And when we do a word count across that whole program, all the titles, all the abstracts, we find that the word transformation only occurred 10 times in that whole program. We can see words like resilience, adaptation, much more abundant. Uh, and five of those incidences of transformation were in that one abstract. So this is still a marginal topic uh, in, in a lot of the broader thinking. And this is a case, even though we know that this resistance can be very costly, it can be impossible, it can be paradoxical. Uh, Connie Millar um, and colleagues warned us over a decade ago that uh, choosing uh, the sort of impulsive option of resisting change could be costly and cataclysmic in a time of, of directional change in the drivers, and, um, and suggested we think uh, more broadly than that. And that call was echoed more recently uh, in a paper by Peter Kariba and Emma Fuller, uh, which just kind of put a point on it uh, when, you know, beyond resilience, how can we do better? How can we think uh, more strategically, more broadly about preparing for the kinds of disruptions our systems face? Um, so while it is true that we can guard in individual resources at small scale, the general grant tree is an important uh, a tree uh, in a national park. We can post uh, staff there to protect it in a time of fire. And while it is true that we can cover glaciers and blankets and slow down their loss, obvious questions emerge about the scalability of both of these efforts uh, and for the bottom right one about how natural that is and, and whether we're still advancing the values that we were managing for if we take some of these artificial actions. Um, managers get this. They get the transformation is happening. They get that they've got uh, a set of, uh, of options, divergent options. But the question is how to apply this uh, strategically, uh, right? We're not accepting that parks and other protected areas can be frozen in time. Uh, but so what do we do and how do we do that in an organized way? And that's, of course, what uh, what we're trying to do with the spectrum and with a lot of guidance and thinking that I can't get into in detail here about uh, using these tools complementarily in, in space and in time and across resources. And our federal um, FedNet group is seeking to, of course, uh, use this and other frameworks, things like how do these frameworks fit into uh, adaptive management cycles, something I can't get into today. But we're, we're trying to build on the work of others and, and try to uh, shift paradigms and work towards best practices uh, that can support managers as they take on these challenges. Our um, more uh, manager-oriented uh, work is focusing on creating guidance, um, lower G guidance, handbook best practices, and ultimately potentially uh, training. And uh, I'll just back up for a second. That's, that's all of us participating in that. And on the more sciencey side, the strong leadership from the USGS side Focus here is on sometimes linking with individual uh, research efforts and working groups uh, to help them understand uh, the, the status of, of the state of manager thinking um, and be transformation aware. And in other ways, uh, this group or this function seeks to more broadly engage with the conservation research community and, and help them be transformation aware and rad aware as well. So I'm going to leave it right here and this slide deck, uh, which I think you will, you'll have access to through the webinar, and I'll try and share the slide deck as well. It has my contact information and some links to some of the work uh, that we're doing in the Park Service. I'm going to sign off here and unshare and uh, hand over um, the presentation to my colleague, uh, Carrie Kappel, who was part of Ocean Tipping Points and can help us understand uh, deeper history of an allied group having thought about 
uh, these issues specifically in a marine context. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, while the screen switches over, I want to say that one thing I failed to mention at the beginning was that if you have any questions, please ask them right away in either the Q&A box or the chat box, both of which are available if you roll your, your cursor down to the bottom of the screen. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Kerry Kappel, who is a research scientist and senior fellow at UC Santa Barbara's National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. In her research, Dr. Kappel uses collaborative synthesis science to develop conservation solutions that protect marine ecosystems and enhance human well-being. Dr. Kappel recently led the Ocean Tipping Points Project, a large multi-institution collaboration which sought to integrate our growing scientific understanding of tipping points and marine ecosystems into ocean management through practical tools and approaches. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kappel. Thanks very much, Zach. Can you tell me if I need to swap my displays or do you just see the single title, the first slide? It looks good. We're just seeing okay. the first slide right now. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Gregor, for an excellent um, presentation and summary of the um, of the great work of the FedNet group so far. Uh, in the marine environment, we've really just started thinking about ecosystem transformations using this framework. Um, as, as Zach mentioned, uh, I was part of the Ocean Tipping Points project. Um, which was a multi-institution collaboration involving um, uh, partners from NOAA, as well as a number of academic um, organizations and some nonprofit partners, uh, looking at the, the, the very real um, potential for ecological transformations in the oceans and um, trying to develop tools to help managers deal with those. Um, what I'm going to do today in just a couple slides is show you a, a few examples that um, start to think about uh, applying RAD in the marine system. Um, I'd say we're not yet at a stage where we can give good examples of management decisions within each category, but, I'll, but uh, consider this um, food for thought and, um, and these, in these examples in are intended to get you um, get you asking questions and thinking about how you would apply this in your own work. Um, I'm going to do a couple examples and then I'm going to hand over to um, Wendy Morrison from NOAA who will uh, tell you about a couple of other examples as well. And then we really want, do want to hear from you um, and hear what challenges you're currently dealing with, how this um, framework could help, and, and what questions you have for Gregor who's thought a lot about this in the terrestrial realm or for either Wendy or I. Um, as we start to think about this in marine systems. And your input is, I think, will be really valuable to the FedNet group as they continue to develop this approach. So, um, as we uh, and many others have noted, um, there are many examples of marine ecosystem transformations that have been observed around the world. Um, these shifts can be due to changes in keystone species. Uh, they can be driven by climate or over harvest or other, um, or other drivers. We've seen this, these kind of uh, shifts in kelp forests that can be driven to um, urchin barrens, the classic coral to algal um, phase shift that's been um, observed in lots of parts of the world, um, fisheries collapses. So these are some of the, the kinds of examples that we drew on for the Ocean Tipping Points project. Coral reefs have really been a poster child for tipping points for a long time based on the dramatic and difficult to reverse changes observed on many Caribbean reefs, um, which have gone from being dominated by living corals to being dominated by fleshy seaweeds. This is actually a Hawaiian reef um, for ocean tipping points. We um, spent a number of years working on a case study of nearshore coral reefs in Hawaii where um, rising stressors were leading to concerns that their reefs might be headed for a tipping point too. And uh, so the, I, in um, talking with FedNet folks, I wanted to start to think about whether, uh, you know, how the resist, adapt, um, direct, or accept direct framework might uh, um, overlay with the kinds of management actions that coral reef managers are already thinking about. Um, I think most of our strategies uh, to date, as in other systems, have fallen in this bucket of resistance, where the focus has been on trying to build the resilience of um, coral reef systems to the suite of drivers that have been pushing them towards a tipping point, which include overfishing, 
um, bleaching, nutrient runoff, uh, sedimentation, et cetera. This um, little infographic is based on the Caribbean example, but there's similar threats around the world. Uh, and um, the typical strategies are um, marine protected areas and fishing limits to try to um, protect and restore populations of particularly herbivorous fish who help to control algae in these, in these systems. Um, but also land-based um, interventions to try to um, control runoff. But all of this is about um, resisting the change and trying to make these systems more um, healthy, preserve more of their intact ecological functions so that when um, the water's warm and there's a risk of coral bleaching, they have, um, they have more resistance to that and they have more capacity for um, recovery following a bleaching event. But what we've been seeing um, around the world is that those bleaching events are coming um, annually and, and they are more frequent. And the um, trajectories for recovery are, um, are actually slower, taking longer. So observed recovery times for many of these systems in the past may have been decades or longer, but we're seeing um, disturbances coming much more frequently. So in, in panel B there, you can see that the average return time for even the fastest recovering weedy coral species, which is that dashed line, is now substantially longer than the available window of recovery um, between bleaching events based on global data. And then down in panel C, um, despite uh, the return to pre-disturbance levels of total coral cover that you see in that inset, um, you're getting differential responses of individual coral species to changing conditions, and that's resulting in a persistent shift in community composition. Um, with match, mass bleaching, a global reality in most parts of the world, the reefs of today already look very different from their pre-warming baselines. So we have been in um, uh, a state of, uh, to some degree, accepting the, the directory of the trajectory of change. Uh, and I think as with the Kenai example that Gregor shared, managers have to ask um, what will fill these niches if corals don't have sufficient time to recover? Is there a way to steward the system to something that preserves some of the ecological functions and benefits of a reef? Uh, there are um, options that I think fall in the bucket of directing the trajectory of change um, to preserve coral reefs. Uh, many of those are reviewed in this recent consensus study by the National Academies. Um, so in that bucket, I think in, are things like managed selection, which is the detection of corals with above average stress tolerance. Um, and then using those in other interventions like managed breeding, um, symbiont manipulation, managed relocation, or genetic manipulation. Um, so in these kind of situations, you could have more stress-tolerant stress corals identified, and grown, and then transplanted out to give corals a chance of um, uh, surviving either in their existing or in new areas. Uh, and that could potentially result in reefs that have a different mix of species but maintain the core ecological functions. Um, I have to note though that like while the use of natural variants can potentially extend the lifetime of current reefs or allow um, migration of reefs uh, and could provide raw genetic material um, to help generate uh, future stress tolerance, uh, it's likely that the, these sort of natural variants alone aren't going to be sufficient to generate the heat tolerance that we need given the, the future climate scenarios that are expected. Um, I think as, as Wendy and I were talking about this example, um, it's, it's a bit fuzzy whether this is um, really just resisting change by trying to give the corals that are there a shot um, or whether it really qualifies as directing change. And I think that may depend on whether the focus of your management is on individual species or the entire reef ecosystem and, and what it is that you're trying to trying to preserve. But, I, but directing change could result in reefs that look quite different from the ones that we, we have today, but perhaps preserve some of their functions. Um, the last point that I want to make just briefly uh, before handing it over to Wendy um, comes from the kelp forest urchin barren example. This is another classic example of a tipping point relationship um, in this case where um, 
related to the abundance of otters as a predator in the system. So when otters were removed due to overhunting um, in the 1800s, that led to big increases in their prey species, including urchins, which can um, can really overgraze coral re or uh, kelp forests and convert them to a very different ecological state. Uh, and one of the things I think is super important to to um, draw from this example is that not everyone thinks that's a bad thing necessarily. So um, different users of the marine ecosystem have different perceptions about and different values that they place on the system. So some users may value um, the intact core, sorry, help, kelp forest and be um, proponents of uh, reintroduction or range expansion of otters, while others may have come to depend on shellfish that are available in um, the absence of their predators, the otters. So their um, abalone and uh, urchin fisheries that depend, uh, that have flourished in the absence of, of otters. So uh, important as we're thinking about this to really um, recognize that different uh, stakeholders have different values for alternate states of the, um, of the ecosystem. And as we are directing the tra trajectory of change, our recovery efforts will have better support if they're really grounded in stakeholder participation um, and, if, and if people's input has been taken into account when informing trade-offs. Okay, with that, I'm gonna hand it over um, to Zach to introduce Wendy and then, um, and then I'll switch over to her slides. Thank you, Carrie. So as we wait for the slides to switch over, I'll introduce Dr. Wendy Morrison, who is a fisheries ecologist with the National Marine Fisheries Services Office of Sustainable Fisheries. She is looking at options for adapting fisheries management for a changing climate and has recently joined the FedNet group. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy. All right. Hi. Um, thanks, Zach. Can everybody hear me? Loud and yep. clear. Awesome. Um, so as um, Zach mentioned, I just recently joined this FedNet group and it's been fascinating. So I joined about a month ago. Um, so I am still wrapping my head around um, how to look at things, what it means for the marine environment and what we can take away from it. But I do, I have really appreciated all the discussions and all I've learned over the last month um, with this FedNet group. So all I'm going to do right now is um, put up a couple, two more ma management challenges that occurred to me that we could think of in the resist, accept, um, direct framework um, and hopefully get the discussion going. And we'll end with some discussion questions because as um, Carrie mentioned, we do want to hear from you. So um, one of the first management challenges that's happened recently is on the West Coast. Um, there has been this uh, marine blob, so a marine heat wave that started about five years ago, and it just brought together an interesting mix of species and uses and created some new issues. And so, for example, Dungeness crab fisheries um, were delayed due to toxic algae um, in the crabs, and so they opened their fishery late. So when they opened their fishery, they obviously went out quickly, put down as many traps as they could to try to make up for some of the lost time. But with the warm blob out there, the um, low on the uh, trophic level species ended up being more inshore than where they were usually were. And the whales followed and that actually put the whales for the first time in direct um, contact with many of these uh, fishing traps. And so we started having lots of mortality due to entanglements of the whales. And so this is one where we can't really resist the change. We can't make the whales go back off. So we're gonna, I guess, focus as um, Gregor mentioned, you can focus on all different things. If you focus on the whale species, we can't force the whales to go back off shore. So we cannot um, resist. So we can either accept and direct. And so the way we're trying to direct this is by having the fishermen think about how they can adapt their pots, maybe with um, lineless gear, so that even though the whales have moved, um, there's less mortality. So that's one you know, example of some of the management challenges we're trying to think about in this um, RAD framework. Okay, Carrie, go ahead to the next one, please. And then 
from the marine fishery standpoint, one of the biggest changes we have seen and are hearing the fishermen talk about on all you know, coasts of the United States is this movement of fish species. So we are seeing large distribution shifts in many fish species. Um, a lot of them, especially on the East Coast, on the Atlantic Coast. So an example here, you can see two graphs from 1973 and 2018 showing the movement of summer flounder. Um, and there have been lots of management challenges around this movement, and I'm not going to get into that. But I just thought this was an interesting thing, way we could look at the resist, adapt, um, accept, direct framework. For example, if we have projections of which species we expect to move to change into an ecosystem, is there, this is now, let me just clarify this, this is completely Wendy thinking, this is not NIMS as a whole thinking. So this is where my brain has gone and I don't want to implicate NIMS in this. But our thought, my thought was, if we can know which species might move into an area, can we have some sort of agreement, and this would be really hard, but agreement on which species are preferred for that area and which species we don't want in the area. And then can we tweak our management levers such in fishing so that we can maybe, if we want a species to establish in a new area, is there a way to limit fishing on that species to increase and speed up the establishment? If there's species we don't want to establish, can we incentivize catching of that species so that we try to limit the movement of that species into an area? So that's just another way I've been trying to wrap my head around how we can use this framework within marine species management. Okay, and so now, next slide please. It's time for you guys. So um, at the bottom, you can see the contacts for all three of us, and we'd love to hear from you. Send us any questions, any thoughts, what you're grappling with, um, and starting a, a discussion on this, I think would be really good. Um, and then we have some trigger questions that we would like to just throw out there to the group, and we've got a little less than 15 minutes that we wanna hear from you, hear from what you're thinking. Do you have some really good examples of where you have started using this resist, accept, direct in your marine sanctuaries, in your reserves, in any other marine management challenges? Um, are there challenges you, you think where the um, framework would be really helpful? We're doing a lot, we think, of resisting. Do you have examples of acceptance? Do you have examples of where you think you're directing? Um, I think, just going down my list, some of the challenges is understanding what the stakeholder values are and how do we incorporate that. At the beginning, Gregor mentioned having to reconsider, reconsider fundamental goals. And I think that's very true for the marine environment as well. And so has anybody started trying to wrap their head around that? Um, and then the final question is, what frameworks are managers using for adaptation, planning, and response? So, um, Zach, I guess you're going to be our moderator. I see we have some chat and questions in, so I guess we're counting on you to just pull up and let us know which ones you want to tackle first. Absolutely. We'll get started on these. So okay, as thanks. far as the trigger questions go, if you have an answer to any of those, fee please feel free to type them in and I will try and state them as I can. Also, as, <clears throat> as Wendy said, uh, the emails are provided. So please send the speakers your answers. I know they're very interested in learning about this. So the first question we have is thinking about navigating ecological change is absolutely needed. I sense that thinking that thinking should include navigating the psychological resistance that we will encounter in our inner, inner circles, agencies, and among our many partners and stakeholders. Could the panelists please speak to the group's thoughts on how we might deploy this paradigm shift most skillfully? And this comes from Jimmy Fox, refuge manager at Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge in Northern Alaska. I have, this is Carrie Kappel. I have one initial thought about that and then, um, I would love to hear uh, from the other panelists, but uh, I think in grappling with climate change and um, the transformations that it is driving in all our systems, not just the ecological ones, but also the social and cultural and economic transformations that are underway across the globe, um, acknowledging the psychology of that is, is really important. And um, it is not, um, perhaps a set of skills that either scientists or managers are typically trained in. It's not in your job description to hold space for people's real um, grief and um, 
uh, fear around um, change, but I, but I think if we don't name that and we don't acknowledge that that's part of the dynamic, uh, it will continue to um, be under the surface and, and make it difficult to move forward with open eyes and um, clear heads and hearts. Uh, so I, I, I put a, a, a um, plug in for um, embracing uh, techniques, facilitation, dialogue, um, to, to really uh, give people space to acknowledge that. Great. Yeah, this is, Gregor. I would just add a couple of thoughts to that great answer, which is uh, in our own work, we've learned to be, you know, those of us who are in this a lot, and maybe it's like being you know, an emergency responder, you get a bit inured to some mm -hmm. of the trauma. Uh, but this is traumatic. It is a bummer. Uh, we would rather not have to deal with these things. We humans don't like this kind of change, even as we drive it. And so in our own work, and I, I hope I, you know, hit it right today, and if not, I'm happy to take feedback. Um, we've tried to say, for instance, there is nothing wrong. In fact, there's everything right about strategically resisting change. Our message is not abandon everything you learned in the 20th century and just get with the program. It's Use those um, tactics and tools you've historically used, but in different ways, uh, recognizing the world is different. And if you want to succeed and invest, in our case, federal resources, public resources wisely, there's simply an imperative. This is a hard truth. Um, so humility, um, and recognition, this is difficult for people. And also recognizing uh, just the diversity of viewpoints. I think Kerry had a nice graphic or two illustrating that a traumatic transformation for one person um, or a partial recovery for one person is a fantastic outcome for somebody else. Uh, so working with that diversity, and I'll just quickly hit a separate question I've seen pop up once or twice in the chat, which is our group does include uh, several social scientists, and we're actually working to bulk up that representation uh, now uh, because we realize this is all fundamentally about values and uh, working with them, understanding how they may be changing uh, as well. So I'll, I'll stop there and see if Wendy has more to add. So thanks, Gregor. Thanks, Carrie. Those were those were really good. The only thing I want to add is what I've seen in fisheries management that can really help is a lot of constant discussion and conversation between the scientists and the managers. And so in cases where the scientists can go to the managers and say, ooh, I see something that's not quite right. I don't know what it means yet, but I see it. Then come back a little bit later and say, okay, we're starting to understand it a little better. We think it means X. And so by the time that they really have wrapped their head around what it means, the managers have been following the science all along and have a better understanding of what happened, how we wrapped our head around the science, and then are more willing to make the changes they need to to adjust to that, that new reality. And so I think a key is constant conversation and discourse between the scientists and the managers and the stakeholders on, on what they're seeing and what's going on. Great, thank you all. Another question that's popped up a couple times in a couple different ways is whether or not state agency staff would be able to get involved with FedNet, and if so, how? Yeah, um, our challenge has been uh, not to bite off more than we can chew, and uh, we felt nervous about having uh, five or six federal uh, management agencies. Uh, we recognize that a lot of the issues are the same, and that when we go um, to our workshops, we find people from municipalities, from counties, from tribes, uh, from all kinds of different uh, governmental units, um, dealing with much the same problem. Um, and so we are enthusiastic about engaging with state folks uh, in various ways. In terms of our own group, we felt so far that we kind of, you know, we've got a couple of dozen people and it's sort of, it's a lot to herd. Um, but this is all organic and, and evolving. And if somebody uh, in, in a state agency wants to connect with us and have a dialogue and figure out how to work together most effectively, we're really open to that. We're we're trying to foster a community of practice here. Thank you. Uh, okay, so another question that we have had pop up is how we, we talked a little bit about um, 
Gregor uh, talked a little bit about possibly introducing species that might be from elsewhere to help direct change. So the question is, how is the issue with allowing non-native or maybe even invasive species to replace the native species handled? Are there invasive species experts on the FedMed group? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and hit this quickly um, so that we can keep moving through questions. This is a larger issue of policy, of, of values, and so on. Um, and uh, it's sort of almost a bit of a third rail because I think in many cases policy hasn't caught up with it. These are issues that managers are raising uh, as they watch things like a boreal system disappear and they wonder if they're going to get a Eurasian thicket or something continentally native uh, from maybe a little bit uh, lower elevation or, or to the south typically. Um, that we have, uh, I'll just speak for the Park Service, we've been involved in some uh, collaborative work to start to develop uh, draft products like risk assessments for thinking about managed relocation, but that's in anticipation of policy uh, clarification on our end that hasn't happened yet. So there's some under the radar work we've done just so that we don't get caught flat footed, um, but that's this is the bleeding edge. And so these are really topical questions where we're still uh, wrestling uh, with it. But I, I would say a lot of that is a little broader uh, than uh, our main focus, which is understanding options and bringing science to bear. Uh, there's law and policy outside of that uh, that governs that process as well as stakeholder values. Thank you. Another question that we had come in rather early was along the Atlantic seaboard, there has been an unusual mortality event in large whales as climate change moves the species either northwards or further offshore where they die from lobster gear entanglement or ship strikes. Is there a transformation solution to this situation as opposed to changing lobster gear fishing policies or changing shipping lanes or developing whale protection, no fishing reserve zones? This is Wendy. Um, I think that's a really good question and not one that I'm really um, an expert on or willing to wade into because there's so much going on there. Um, I know that NOAA as a whole is really trying to wrap our head around that in conjunction with Canada um, through our protected resources division. So I'm happy to um, put you in contact with one of the experts who's dealing with that directly, but that's not something I think I can wade into at this point. Great. So another question that we've had pop up is how can we ensure that natural resource agencies have the flexibility in their governance structures to ensure that changing systems can be incorporated into future management approaches, especially when their missions are often place based. Can you repeat that one, Zach? Sorry. This is yes. How can we ensure that natural resource agencies have the flexibility in their governance structures to ensure that changing systems can be incorporated into future management approaches, especially when their missions are often place-based? Yeah, that's a doozy one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's something we're all struggling with. And so um, even National Marine Fisheries Service is not place-based and we're struggling with that, trying to figure out where we have the flexibility, where we don't have the flexibility, how can we better incorporate it? And so what I've been trying to suggest as a way to do this, at least with the National Marine Fisheries Service, is through a tool called scenario planning, which I know Gregor has done a lot with, where you can come up with plausible futures in a very general sense. And then what I'm hoping we can get our managers to do is look through and say, if we have these plausible futures, where do we have the current flexibility to deal with it and where do we not? So we can start where possible. I mean, we are limited often by our mandates, but where possible, can we insert some of that flexibility into our management before it's needed? Um, and that's just a really, at least a first take on it. Maybe Gregor, who's done more scenario planning, has more he can add to that. But that, that is a really hard question and that's something we're struggling with. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things. Scenario planning is a great way to help people approach the fact that the future will be different and that there's uncertainty uh, in a less threatening manner. That's still more on the sort of management culture end. You know, part of the question, I think this is from Bob Glazer, is um, what about these governing structures and, and, and policies or understandings of policy? And that's hard stuff. And we've sort of felt like, particularly being a multi-jurisdictional group, those structures vary group to group, and we haven't really focused on that. We recognize that's the hard stuff. Uh, 
the one thing I would say is some of those limits are just hard limits. One can imagine they might change, just like one can imagine the world could be very different very quickly, scenario planning. But some of them are pretty fixed for now, and you know that's like some of our managed relocation thinking is in preparation perhaps for a larger discussion so that we're ready to, to engage in that intelligently. The other thing I would say is um, what we've found to a degree, and this is sort of pre-publication kind of stuff, but is that uh, some of our perceptions, and, and I'm one of these folks, uh, of policy have been more uh, constraining than what some of our policy gurus suggest are the intended interpretations. We sometimes apply management paradigms and habits of thought uh, filters onto what we think policy allows and doesn't allow. And uh, the National Park Service is a fairly conservative organization. We've got a mission to preserve resources unimpaired. But it doesn't say we have to preserve those resources exactly where they have historically been. Um, and we anticipate species range shift, and it's not like we are aggressively trying to repel uh, species who are new to parks, um, but maybe have been around for millennia 100 miles south of, of a particular park. Um, so the bottom line is some of these constraints are real. Some of them are a bit imagined. Our focus has been more on that imagined end and on the manager uh, management paradigms rather than on policy, which just varies across our different contributing agencies. All right. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there. I would like to thank all of the speakers for their time. Um, I apologize that we were not able to get to all of the questions. However, the speakers will be given the questions after the webinar. And we do encourage you to email the speakers uh, contact the speakers with your questions and with some of your answers to some of these trigger questions. They are very interested in hearing back from you. So thank you all for attending and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, Thanks so much, Zach. Thanks everyone for dialing in. Thank you all.